Welcome to Generation Impact Academy and uh, tonight we're doing topic number 72 and the title of this particular topic is numerology and we're going to go through a couple of numbers tonight but for those who do not know me I'm Pastor Leslie Hessel and I'll be with you for the next uh, 30 minutes or so as we cover this particular topic but before we get into the topic and the meat of it let's just commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Father we just thank you for this opportunity. To be able to come together, Father, to be able to study your word once more. Lord, we never take these moments lightly nor for granted. And Father God, we thank you for being able to receive that which the word has for us. We pray tonight that even those that listen, Father God, that their ears will be anointed to receive that which the word has because the Bible teaches and says that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And Lord, we thank you tonight for that word that falls on fertile ground, that it takes root, grows, develops, and becomes fruitful in the life of the year. So Father, we choose to give you all glory in advance for everything that will be accomplished this evening in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah. Welcome, welcome, welcome to everybody. Um, as for those people that are just signing on on uh, the broadcast channels, uh, we are on topic 72 tonight, and uh, we're going to be looking at numerology. And I'm going to go through a couple of Bibles and what the Bibles, uh, Bible verses say about uh, numerology and about numbers. And numbers are significant in the Bible because... Especially if numbers are mentioned more than once, we know that it's got a spiritual connotation and meaning to it as well. So tonight we're not, we're not going to have the time to be able to explore and exploit every single one in great detail. But we'll cover as many of those as we can and then we're going to leave the rest of them up to you to, to, to go and research and look at at your own leisure and at your own time. Uh, we've got a, quite a list on here in your notes. So you'll see in your notes there's, there's a fair whack of them. So let's let's get, get going and uh, let's have a look and see what these are. The first one is obviously look at the number one in scriptural from a scriptural perspective. No one always represents unity. And in Deuteronomy chapter six and verse four it says, "Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one." We know that the Lord is one, is triune being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but He makes up one. He is one. And so it basically denotes completeness. A completeness, sorry, sufficiency and origin. It's an exclusive number. It's not a number that can be shared. Um, and it's God's number. All right. So, and so we can understand then that the number one talks about unity. Um, and whenever you see the number one brought up and discussed in scripture, it, it normally refers to that. Number two, number, uh, number two talks about union, division, and witnessing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 47, it says the following. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. So the moral universe is divided between good and evil, one and two. Personalities reflect this contrast. We have a Cain and Abel. We have Ishmael and Isaac. We have Jacob and Esau. And Christ is called the second man in contrast to the first man who was Adam. All right. So the number two then refers to as union, division, and witnessing. We also see in the Proverbs... Um, in uh, sorry, the, the problems are all full of comparisons between righteousness and and foolishness. In agreement, it was necessary under the Old Testament um, provisions that two witnesses were necessary to bring about a judgment. And then the law was written in, on two tablets. Jesus appealed to the witness of his father as a testimony to the Jews' two covenants. Give us the progressive testimony of the will of God. The book of Revelation speaks of two witnesses that God sends to condemn the works of the ungodly. Revelations 11 verse 3, And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will pro prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. So the number two then refers to union, division, and witnessing. The number three refers to resurrection, completeness, and perfection. Three is God's signature that something is true. Abraham was visited by three angels to verify the fact he and Sarah would have a child. We see that in Genesis 18 verses 1 through 3 which reads, Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. God's basic manifestations are as Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. Three times Jesus was divinely approved by a voice 
from heaven. When he was crucified, his claim as king was written in three languages upon his cross. Peter was given the vision of God's acceptance of the Gentiles three times in the books of, book of Acts chapter 10. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7 through 8 reads, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. So the number three is therefore refers to resurrection, completion, and perfection. So we see that in Scripture and it's backed up by many, many examples. The number four. The number four, we see that there's creation and the signature of the world. It is equipped to four directions, four winds, four corners. There are four basic races of people. Four world empires are spoken of in the book of Gen uh, Daniel. Sorry, Four is symbolic of the earth and its inhabitants. Jesus described <clears throat> four different kinds of so uh, soils that the seed fell upon in the parable of the sower. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, which represents four different human spiritual conditions. So we can then see again number four in scripture refers to uh, creation and the signature of the world. Whereas number three was more a signature of God and the completeness and perfection. Number four is more got to do with the worldly side of things. The number five talks about the grace of God's goodness. Um, the tabernacles had dimensions that were all divisible by five. David picked up five smooth stones to challenge Goliath. Jesus fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes. Ten virgins were divided into groups of five as one's finding grace and the others did not. And then the steward with five talents and increased those five, uh, five more was given to uncultivated talent of the a slothful steward. So again, many examples in scripture that talks about the number five. And you can see how God's grace and goodness is represented and shown in that. Especially like if you look at the, the 5,000 people fed with five loaves. If we see the, the good stewards, the one with five talents multiplied to ten. And we see um, the virgins that you had, the ten virgins, five and five. Five being prepared, five being not, not being prepared. So the five talks about grace and goodness of God towards mankind. Then the number six refers to the weakness of man, evils of Satan, and manifestation of sin. Very often six is referred to as the number of the of devil as well. So he was created on the sixth day. Six days are uh, designated for his labor. It is the number of completeness of, of uh, failing, falling short of the glory and blessing of God. Six cities of refuge were designated for one who committed manslaughter. Solomon in his glory had a yearly revenue of triple six talents of gold. Six steps lay before his throne. It was a glorious kingdom but fell short of God's kingdom. The great giant Goliath was six cubits tall. He wore six pieces of armor and had a spearhead that weighed 600 shekels. Then you've got Nebuchadnezzar erected an image 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide. The number of man is, who is Antichrist is triple six. Jesus hung upon the cross for six hours to provide atonement for man's dispensation of disobedience. We see in Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16 through 19, it says, These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed in innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, um, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies and one who sows of discord among brethren. Then the number seven talks about completeness and spiritual perfection. Um, we can see many examples of number seven. Uh, used in scripture. It says there are many sevens pro uh, programmed into creation. Seven days for one week. Seven year cycle of weather. Seven colors in the rainbow. Seven notes on a musical scale. The seventh day was the Sabbath day of rest. The priest sprinkled blood upon the mercy seat seven times. 
There were seven feasts of Jehovah. <coughs> Excuse me. Joshua com compassed the walls of Jericho for seven days with seven priests following seven trumpets. On the seventh day, they marched around seven times. Jesus gave the measure of perfect forgiveness by stating it is 70 times seven. Seven deacons were appointed in Acts chapter 6 to bring service and harmony to believers. Seven epistles were written in seven churches or to seven churches. Seven messages were given to seven churches of Asia. This represents complete instruction for the churches of all the ages. The number seven is used 54 times just in the book of Revelation. It's a book of, that completes the story of redemption. The seventh man from Adam escaped death by walking with God and he was translated. So we can see the, verse, the number seven then is a number of completeness and spiritual perfection. With all these examples of how seven brings things together, it is whenever you see in, 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 in life and in the world and everything, you can see how seven represents completeness. Then the number eight talks about new birth, new creation, new beginnings. Um, eight people, <clears throat> Noah and the family were saved in the flood. You know the story of Noah when um, the great flood and when he had to go with him and his family into the ark. Uh, eight people, Noah and family, were saved in the flood. Circumcision took place on the eighth day of a male child's life. So when the baby when it was born, uh, Abraham was instructed to circumcise that child on the eighth day. Priests were cons consecrated for seven days and began their ministry on the eighth day. Lepers, they could re-enter the mainstream of life upon the eighth day of being clean. Jesus took his disciples upon the Mount of Transfiguration to see his glory after eight days. Jesus appeared to doubting Thomas on the eighth day of his resurrection. The first day and, and is in Disneyland as the Lord's Day or a day of a new beginning. The name Jesus in the Greek has a numerical value of triple eight. So you can see then that eight represents new beginnings, new starts. And uh, the number eight, <clears throat> I find very interesting that um, in, in the life of Thomas, Jesus appeared to him um, on the eighth day of his resurrection. And, you know, although people refer to Thomas as a doubting Thomas, um, and that's a general description that's used when they talk about Thomas, it is, it is God's grace that's extended to him because the second that, that he heard and he had the manifestation from God for himself, that moment he changed his mind. And that moment things changed and he started living his life and he received a uh, living self of Christ and living and receiving the fullness of what God had for him. He needed that moment though where God showed himself real to him for him to be able to believe and to receive that. So number eight then talks about new birth, new beginnings and uh, new creation. The number nine talks about the fruit of the spirit, <coughs> excuse me, and complete uh, divine completeness from him. We see Israel was commanded to rest the seventh day, not planting even or even reaping the volunteer crops. As they obeyed, God uh, would command his blessing upon the produce of the sixth year and it would last until the ninth year or until the crops of the eighth year were harvested. We see that in Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 16 to 22. It says, so you shall observe my statutes. And keep my judgments and perform them and you will dwell in the land safely. Then the land will yield its fruit and you will eat your fill and dwell therein safely. And, it will, and if you say, what shall we eat or in the seventh year since we shall not sow nor gather in our, in our produce? Then I will command my blessing on your sixth year and will bring forth produce enough for three years. And you shall sow in the eighth year. And, the, and eat all produce upon the ninth year until its, produce, until its produce comes in. You shall eat of the old harvest. So we can see how God's blessing comes in these, these cycles and uh, it happens on the ninth, in the ninth year. So it talks about fruit of the Spirit, divine completeness from God. 
Then we see the fruit of the Spirit. It's listed in the book of Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22 through 23. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these there is no law. Okay, or against such there is no law. So we understand then if we look at the fruit of the Spirit that it talks about the fact that there's nine of them. And it refers to the, the, the completeness that we find in God. Because if you research those, those things, there is no law against it. If you live your life according to those nine fruits of the Spirit, and those nine fruits are manifest in your life, the law is no threat to you. The law is no issue to you because you are doing everything right and everything in, in completeness. You're living out your life according to a standard for which they, it, it's, a, it's a moral standard, not a, a, a standard according to law. Then we also see the gifts of the Spirit. Galatians, I'm oh, sorry, Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And from verse 8 through 10, it mentions them. Remember that chapter 12 and chapter 14 talks very much about the fruits. And then chapter 13 also referred to as a love chapter sandwiched between these. Basically to me indicating that the fruits require the gift of love to operate and to freely be able to um, give and, and allow that to impact the lives of the people. So 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10 says this, For to one is given the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, through the same Spirit. To another faith, by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing, by the same Spirit. To another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretations of tongues. These are to be enjoyed until the end of time when the whole new harvest of blessing will come in. And so while we are on earth, God gives us two clear um, elements or, or things that are there for you and I to demonstrate and show the completeness of spirit in us. And the first, the fruit of the spirit and the second one is the gifts of the spirit. Fruits of the Spirit is basically stuff that you and I manifest. The fruit of the Spirit, uh, sorry, the gifts of the Spirit is something that the Holy Spirit gives us by His Spirit to be able to, to help others. Um, whenever I minister on the fruits of the Spirit, it is interesting to note that the fruit of the Spirit is, is there for the benefit of others mostly. So when it operates in your life, it's very rare and very seldom that that fruit of the Spirit actually benefits you. It normally benefits others that are around you. Your faith is used for others. Miracles are used through you for others. Um, discerning of spirits, the, the prophecy, interpretation of tongues, tongues, all these things are there for the benefits of others and not necessarily for you and I. So therefore, it's very interesting that, that there's the two groups, the fruits and the gifts, both number nine and both refer to the completeness or wholeness of man. So that is what we see with the number nine then. And then secondly, we also see that there's in um, Jesus died in the ninth hour making final atonement for sin. In Mark chapter 15 verse 33 to 34 it says this, Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, so for three hours. And, all the, and at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Aloya, aloya. Lama Sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then number three, Peter and John went up to the temple to pray at the ninth hour. A miracle was performed upon a crippled man. Remember, they went up there and when they, when they got to the door, the crippled man looked at him and said, um, you know, they were, he was wanting, uh, basically at that time he was looking for arms from, from the two of them. But then Peter turned around and said, that which I have, I give unto you. And the man was, was raised and healed. So we see then that there's a completeness that came upon the individual. And that all manifested in the ninth hour. And then the third point is Peter and John went up to the, sorry, um, point four. Cornelius was praying in this ninth hour and received an angelic visitation. Remember the whole story about Cornelius and needing people to come pray with him. And so he has this angelic visitation and Paul is sent to him to come and lead him and his family to the Lord. All happened in the night. He was praying in the ninth hour. Then number 10. The number 10 talks about testimony, law and responsibility. God gave, I think the, most, the best example most of is God gave 10 commandments which were given to Israel as a nation. 
Now, we know that there was many more laws that were promulgated and put into the books of the Bible after that through Moses. But those three or those ten commandments that were given, that were put on, on stone tablets, encapsulates just about everything else. All the others are subdivisions of that if you actually walk in the fullness of those ten, you'll experience the others. But there were ten, nevertheless. Ten commandments talking about law and responsibility. Okay. Pharaoh's power was confronted to ten times to let Israel go. Because he resisted the call of God, he was judged ten times with ten plagues. Alright, so also very interesting that that brings uh, law and, and, and responsibility upon the Pharaoh even before the Israelites were let go. The final word power is illustrated as ten toes in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 41. It says, whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. Then we also see in Daniel 7.7, 7, it talks about the ten horns again, um, which represents a, uh, a formidable world power. And it says, after I saw in the right vision, in the night vision, sorry, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, it had a huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue which it, with its feet. It was different from all the beasts, and they were before it, and it had ten horns. Then number four, man is held responsible to return one tenth of his increase. Malachi three, which talks about the tithe. So many people resist and fight it, but I always tell people this, if you want the blessings and the reward of tithing, then surely you and I must tithe. Because if you don't tithe, how can you expect the reward or the blessing upon it? But nevertheless, God has got a requirement that at least a minimum, as, as far as I'm concerned, of 10% of our income goes to honor Him and to, and to give Him glory, give Him honor, um, because that is in recognition of your dependence upon Him, your recognition that He is Lord, your recognition that every perfect and good upon your life originates and comes from Him. So it is really recognizing God in your life at the end of the day. Then we've got the fifth point, which is the ten virgins, uh, which were judged, and uh, some of them wise, some of them foolish, some of them prepared, some of them unprepared. And uh, in Matthew 25, where it talks about these virgins, um, it is sort of like generally accepted that it's a, a prophetic image of what is, is to come. And uh, all of them being virgins, ten virgins, all represents uh, the body of Christ, or represents those that are born again and saved and, and uh, you know, on their way to heaven. But then it talks out of those, um, they are the wise and the, and the foolish, those that are prepared, those that were not. And even though some of people recognize and, and believe this is a, a prophetic image, I'm praying, Lord, let it not be, because I don't want to see half the people that, that we believe are going to heaven fall by the wayside. I believe, I'm trusting God that 100% of the people that believe will make it to heaven. So let's trust God together. And then number 11, and so uh, from number 11 onwards, uh, there's quite a few numbers. We can, I'm going to focus, just for the sake of time, um, just on, on two or three more. But the number... 11 talks about judgment and disorder. You can go through that one on your own. Then 12 talks about government of God. We saw there are 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, so we know that there were 12 tribes. And then we know that the 12 apostles, Jesus chose 12 disciples to follow him. And then in the book of Revelation, we see that the 24 elders that sat before the throne. And uh, that is believed to be a composite of Old and New Testament elders that make up the 24 elders. Then we saw that the New Jerusalem has 12 gates with 12 angels guarding the 12 gates. And uh, then we also see that there are 12 foundations. The dimensions that are given as 12,000 furlongs in four directions. So there you have an image then of, of the New Jerusalem and it talks about the government, governance and the order, government and order of God. So in Scripture, then you can see the, the, the 12 tribes, the 12 uh, apostles, and uh, the 24 elders, etc., etc. Those all talk about government and order and the things that God has ordained and put in place as far as government of God is concerned. Then you'll see 
Number 13 talks about depravity and rebellion. 14 talks about deliverance of salvation. 15 talks about rest. 16 about love. 17 about victory. 18 about bondage. 19 about faith. 20 about redemption. 21 about the exceeding sinfulness of sin. And then 22 light. 23 death. 24 the priesthood and intercession. 25 the forgiveness of sins. 26 the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. 27 preaching of the gospel. 28 eternal life. Uh, 29 a departure. 30 the blood of Jesus. Okay, and that one should be pretty self-explanatory. Remember, he's, he, he went to the cross when he's 30 and he went into full-time ministry at the age of 30. 31 talks about offspring. 32 speaks about covenant. Uh, 33 talks about promise. 20, 34, naming of a, of, of a son. 35, hope. 36, enemy. Uh, 37, the word of God. 38, slavery. And then 39, healing of diseases. And uh, 40 talks about trials, probations, and testimonies. Let's, let's just expand on that one a little bit quickly. It talks about, number one, Moses' life was a series of 40 years. So we look at 40 years, um, you know, the preparation, the wilderness experience, etc., etc. all talks about 40-year blocks, all right? Then we saw that spies who viewed Canaan for 40 days and reported negatively. So when, when Moses sent the spies into the lane, the promised land and they came back, they, they were in there for 40 days. All right. And then came back with a negative report, bar two of them. Then Israel wandered in the desert for 40 years because of their unbelief. All right. So there was another 40 year cycle that went, went around because of the unbelief and time, time that they spent in the desert area. Saul, David and Solomon reigned as kings for 40 years each. Okay. So there again, we see that um, the 40 year cycle. Then Jesus was tempted for 40 days uh, without sinning in the wilderness. Remember, he went once, once he was uh, baptized, he went into the wilderness for 40, year, 40 days. Came back and that's when he went to the synagogue, took the book um, of Isaiah and read <coughs> and um, read his proclamation. It was basically um, his call, what God placed upon his life. And he said, today this has been uh, fulfilled in your, in your ears, etc., etc. So there you go, you see the 40-day cycle. Then Jesus showed himself alive to his disciples for 40 days as undeniable proof. So after he came back, after he was crucified, died, gave his life raised from the dead he was he showed himself alive to his disciples before the ascension remember another 10 days then went past after that before you see the 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 um day of pentecost all right and the outpouring of the holy spirit so in 40 then you see a whole another series of of, of confirmations of what, what 40 means so 40 talks about trial probation and testings then 42 talks about israel's oppression and the second coming 45 talks about preservation, 50 talks about the Holy Spirit, 60 talks about pride, 66 talks about idol worship, 70 talks about universal, universal, universality, uh, Israel and the restoration, 100 talks about God's election of grace and the children of promise, 119 talks about the resurrection day and Lord's day, 120 talks about divine period of probation, 144 the spirit guarded life 153 talks about fruit bearing 200 talks about insufficiency 600 talks about warfare 666 the number of the beast 888 talks about jesus the first resurrection saints as, you, as i said earlier if you take the hebrew numer or, yeah, the numerical value of or just the greek numerical value of jesus comes to plate then a thousand talks about divine completeness of god we see that in Deuteronomy 7 verse 9 says, Therefore know that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love Him and keep His commandments. Psalm 64, sorry, 84.10 For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. In Psalm 50 verse 10 For every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. 2 Peter 3 8. But beloved, do not forget this one thing that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years 
as one day. And then, of course, you also know the millennium that is spoken about in the book of Revelation. So it talks about divine completeness and the, and the glory of God. So numerology in the Bible, then, is, is very interesting. It is something that gives us depth and insight into much of what Scripture is about. So it allows us to get a deeper insight of the Word, and it obviously opens the Word up so that we can receive that which God and the Holy Spirit has for us. Uh, sorry I rushed through this, but there was so much I had to go through and uh, weren't even able to touch everything I wanted to say. But nevertheless, there you've got it. And uh, you can, those that we didn't go into, into great detail, you can take those and go and spend your own time and just research and see. As I said, these, these numbers will appear in Scripture more than once. And therefore, whenever it appears, there is a, a, a spiritual significance to that. And you can then glean more from the Word of God. So until next time, may the Lord richly bless you.